Goa Arts and Literary Festival is conceptualized, organized, and hosted by the International Center Goa in association with Goa Writers Group, Ministry of Culture, Government of India, Northeastern Council, Ministry of Development of Northeastern Region, Shillong Meghalaya, and the Director of Art and Culture, Government of Goa. A publicity partner is Maxins, digital partner is Siahi, and official bookstore is Broadway Book Center. We will now begin this session. This session is GAL 2016 Ambedkar Memorial Lecture. The topic is Dr. Ambedkar's role in national reconstruction, and the lecture will be given by Mr. Suresh Mani. Ladies and gentlemen, I would like to welcome you all to another lecture of Dr. B. R. Ambedkar Memorial Lecture Series. The lecture series was begun in 2014 to propagate the ideals and memory of Dr. Ambedkar in Goa. Dr. Ambedkar, as you would be aware, was a leader of the most discriminated against sections of South Asian society, also one of the leading civil rights campaigners in the world, the architect of India's constitution, and the founding spirit behind much of India's economic and social institutions from the Reserve Bank of India to current laws on labor rights and also including the rights, women's rights. But the works and ideas of Dr. Ambedkar have sadly lacked the recognition they deserve, especially in Goa, where many of the issues he discussed still confound us. His ideals of justice for all through a constitutional regime and a trenchant critique of the caste system and the way it operates in the contemporary society are, the, are particularly important in contemporary India as well as Goa. The Memorial Committee seeks to bring these sorts of issues back into the spotlight through the Memorial Lecture Series. Our speaker today, Dr. Suresh Mane, is Dr. Suresh Mane. He is an academic and a prolific writer, as well as an advocate, a constitutional expert, and one of the founding member, members of a Bahujan Samaj party a former professor and a head of Department of Law, University of Mumbai, is today a visiting scholar of various colleges and law schools in US and in India. He has authored many books, monograph, and research articles on a wide range of issues, issues including constitutional law, economics, politics, social history, human rights, and Indian constitution. His latest books are The Man Who Codified Indian Independence, 2010, in Constitutional Law, Dynamics and Challenges, 2012, and Demons and of Democracy, Crony Capitalism, Corruption, and Corrupt Political Class. I would like to thank Dr. Mane for accepting the invitation and invite him to begin his lecture. We also have Amita Kanekar who is going to chair the session. Dr. Mane, please. Amita, the chair of this uh, session, the organizers of the Goa Festival, Delegates, friends. First and foremost, I must compliment and thank to the organizers. Although this is a festival related to arts and other things, you include a one serious discourse topic in this festival, and that, that is with an object to propagate the ideas of Dr. Ambedkar, who led one of the biggest human rights struggle in the Southeast Asia to introduce to the people of the Goa. Let me clarify. When it comes to Ambedkar, we have a one notion. That we have heard a lot about Ambedkar. We have read a lot about Ambedkar. So what is there new to understand from him, from his struggle? Is there anything new to discover and rediscover him? And I must answer this proposition in a positive way. People are yet to understand Ambedkar, his struggle, his ideas, his philosophy in a proper perspective. Number one. Number two, it is still under exploration. Why it is still under exploration? And the reason is, the most of the writings that Ambedkar was confined to the Marathi language till 1970-80. 
it is only after his uh, birth anniversary year, that is 1991, his entire corpus is available to the others in a language of English. And therefore, the non marathi people or the non marathians they are yet to be uh, familiar with the ideas and the struggle of Dr. Ambedkar. Number three, Ambedkar is a basically anti-establishment model. And being an anti-establishment model, there is no enough marketization of Ambedkar like a Gandhi. I am a categorical in my statement. There is no much marketization of Ambedkar either at a national or international level. And therefore, Ambedkar is less understood, more misunderstood by most of the Indians and the people at abroad. That is also one reason. Now why I have begun my discourse with this kind of a propositions? And the reason is, as earlier session was on marginalization. And I was hearing it carefully. Whether you are a writer coming from a particular sect or area or a language, there is a process of marginalization. And the questions were raised by the different delegates. But the basic element remains the same. The process of the marginalization is an essential and inseparable part of the Indian cultural life, which is based primarily on the hegemony of the few people and the suppression of the large people. Unless you take on that issue, you will not be in a position to end that culture of marginalization. And Ambedkar deals with that. Since Ambedkar deals with the outlawing the whole culture of the marginalization, being an anti-establishment model, it doesn't suit the interest of the status quo people. And since it doesn't suit the interest of the status quo people, Ambedkar is hardly reflected in the policy perceptions and the policy formulations. And therefore, although Ambedkar had the vast reservoir to reconstruct this country, Ambedkar is, in fact, we call it as annihilated by the so-called knowledge-producing industries of this country because he himself being an untouchable and there is an annihilation of an untouchable, although he called for the country for the annihilation of the caste. I just had a glance over this even a book exhibition here. I saw the book on Alexander the Great. Right from the Alexander the Great to the even the modern story writers. But there is not a single book either on Ambedkar or by Ambedkar. Now how it happens? And I asked the one of the publisher, he said, we have published so many books on Ambedkar books by Ambedkar, but in such festivals we hardly bring those kind of books. Now I, I saw one uh, small book on caste. Now in order to understand the caste, unless you go into the deep roots right from the Ketkar to Ambedkar, nobody will be in a position to understand the caste discourse and in the modern context from the Gure to Sri Devasa. But you will find some books on the same issues, but not a single book on Ambedkar or by Ambedkar. And it happens like that because, and the reason is well explained by some of the scholars, including the Professor Upendra Bakshi, who rightly says, there is a process of a, a conspiracy which is by way of a theoretical silence. Theoretical silence to the revolutionary thoughts or the ideas of the Ambedkar. And so the Ambedkar remains less understood, more misunderstood. And therefore Ambedkar is hardly equated with the Dalit empowerment. <coughs> Ambedkar is hardly equated with the affirmative actions. And other than affirmative action program, or the upliftment of the Dalits or the downtrodden's, we don't see Ambedkar's role in a national reconstruction. And that is, we carry or we understand the Ambedkar as it is. 
but within the just uh, span of 40 45 minutes we will deliberate on his role of national reconstruction in a different way which you will i will be in a position to convince you that he has uh, played a very pioneer role in a reconstructing the whole of india now let me begin with the first thing and that ambedkar social political life starts from 1916 to 1956 it is a four decades. And in these four decades, as a writer, as a thinker, he starts from in the first writing in 1915 on Indian ancient commerce. Now, Ambedkar never started writing on caste first. Caste, he wrote in 1916 for the Columbia University in the United States of America for one seminar. The title was The Cast Its Genesis, Mechanism and Development. So in 1915 he writes on Indian ancient commerce. 1916 he writes on Cast Its Genesis, Mechanism and Development. And 1918 he writes on Small Land Holdings in India, The Problems of the Indian Agriculture. 1923 he comes with his writing The Provisional Finance in British India. And in 1925, at the age of 24, Ambedkar was invited by the Hilton Young Commission, appointed by the British government, to give a testimony on the Indian currency as an economist. So take these four things together. 1915, he speaks about the ancient Indian commerce. 16, he talks about the caste. 18, he talks about the agriculture, 23, about the financial mismanagement by the Britishers in India. And in 25, on the currency issue, he gives the testimony, evidence before the Hilton Young Commission as an economist at, at the age of 24. These four instances take it separately. And by taking these four instances, one can try to understand Ambedkar in a current perspective that in 1915 he speaks about the trade and commerce. Now in ancient Indian commerce, when you write about how the India had a correlation with the neighboring countries or the neighboring provinces with regard to the trade. And in that context, he discusses about the village economy. Now the discussion about the village economy always reflected in the stories and the writings and the novels and even the big, big textbooks authored by the renowned scholars, including even Gandhi. Now, 1915, Ambedkar says, village economy and the village life has ruined the people of India. 1915. Now, you compare this Ambedkar state, uh, statement of 1915, it is a similar to Marx's statement in Das Capital, Volume 1. Village economy has ruined the people of this country. Number one. Number two, village life has created the provincial loyalism which is a deadly against the system of nationalism. So in future, if India at all will have a problem of nationalism, your village life will be primarily responsible for it. Third, village life has become the backbone of the India's backwardness. Now, on village economy, he was so clear, upright, in denouncing the village life. Gandhi stood for it. He loved the villages. And even our modern so-called intellectuals who live in the cities, enjoy the urban life, they have also infinite love for the village life. If they are forced to go and stay in the village for three days, ten days, five days, they will definitely run away from the villages to Pune, Bombay, to Goa. Let me tell you here, Gandhi wanted a village life or village as the basic unit of the Indian constitution of India. Rajendra Prasad, another stalwart, chairman of the Constituent Assembly, he wrote to the B.N. Rao, who was the constitutional advisor, asking B.N. Rao to direct the drafting committee of the constitution. 
that village should be made as the basic unit of the Indian constitution. Ambedkar said nothing doing. He strongly stood against the views of Gandhi and even Prasad. Even Rao, those who don't understand the constitution making process, they simply say Ambedkar was just following the advice of the so many committees and the so many people. You check it here. He refused to follow the advice of the Gandhi, he refused to follow the advice of the Prasad and even B. N. Rao, who was the constitutional advisor. And on 4th November 1948, he was very categorically in introducing the draft constitution of India, saying, what are the villages? Dance of ignorance, poverty, exploitation. They cannot become the base unit of the new India. Today we understand the village economy, where the institutions like half panchayat flourish. Today's rural economy, where even among the tribals or the nomadics, they have the rural organizations, which that organization do not allow even the rule of law to enter into. With that kind of a medieval structure, how you can build up a modern India? That was a very good question. And therefore, America tried to demolish that ancient kind of model, which was primarily based upon the caste. And whenever we come to the issue of the caste, as I said, normally even the present generation of the students in India who pursue on the caste, their knowledge or discourse through the so-called knowledge producing industries like the schools and the universities. Where Ambedkar is hardly taught on the caste, your discourse starts from the A.M. Gure and ends with the Srinivas, the modern sociologist. But you hardly consider Ambedkar as a sociologist and you introduce his part on annihilation of caste as a part of curriculum. Bombay University recently, 10 years back, introduced the annihilation of the caste book for the curriculum of the MA sociology. How many universities deal with those issues? And in that annihilation of the caste, which was a speech not delivered, but it was prepared for the Lahore conference in 1936. So, America starts from 1916, caste, its genesis, mechanism and development, elaborates in 1936 on annihilation of the caste. And in annihilation of the caste, he analyzes the whole social structure of this country. Now, in that book, he makes two categorical statements. Number one, I am opposed to any kind of a monopolistic system. In fact, I would like to demolish such kind of monopoly. So, America's philosophical base is here, one of the pillar. One of the pillar is that, that he was opposed to any kind of a monopoly in favor of any class. It means, in order to reconstruct the Indian society, you have to demolish the ancient social pyramidical order based on the system of a gradation and degradation. The system of the gradation and degradation means that system elevates the few and condemns many. And that condemnation comes on the ground of several factors. One, biological factors, then by birth, and by social institutions. Now the Indian social system comprises of such social institutions <coughs> where as we were discussing earlier, the marginalization, and therefore I said, the marginalization is a part, integral part of the social institutions or rather social life of this country for years together, for years together. And unless we demolish, unless we annihilate completely, wipe out that process of segregation and desegregation, you will continue with the system of the marginalization. Ambedkar was attacking on that. And the process, the basic institutions, according to Ambedkar, that emanates, that comes from either Varna or the caste. Now here Ambedkar differs with the Gandhi. 
Gandhi said, Varna is a natural and essential. Gandhi says, caste is not essential. But Varna is a natural and essential because it is a division of labor. Ambedkar says, unless you demolish the mother of the caste, that is the Varna, you will not be in a position to demolish the caste. Varna has resulted into a caste system. And therefore, if you want to demolish the caste, you have to demolish the Varna culture, the fourfold structure, which Gandhi considered essential and necessary, natural. Ambedkar said, you have to demolish it. And therefore, Ambedkar was very vocal in saying that if the Indians, the people of India would like to reconstruct this entire society on the modern pillars of a liberal life, liberal democracy, Ambedkar was quite clear in saying that unless you, unless you kill this monster of the caste, you will not have social, economical and political support. <coughs> You turn in any direction, caste is the monster that crosses your each and every path. Now in 21st century, let us verify Ambedkar's claim and statement. Unless you kill this monster of a caste, you will not have any kind of reforms, either social, economic and cultural part. In 21st century, what is the role of the caste again? Go back to Ambedkar's statement in 1936, kill the monster. Whether that monster is the following people of this country, even today, whether the people of this country, either this or that part, are a victim of this monster, because of this monster, either they suffer from socio-economical, political, whatever it is. And the answer is yes. Even in the United Kingdom, 2010, they passed the equality law making any kind of uh, discrimination on the basis of caste. Two states from the United States of America in 2007, they passed a law banning any kind of a discrimination on the basis of the caste. And the government of India on each and every international and national forums denounces the caste, saying that it is our internal affair, international community should not interfere. So, America's main contention was that unless you kill this monster of the caste, you cannot have socio-economic, political, cultural reforms, reconstruction. Now, this caste phenomena has resulted into a marginalization of the women folk of this country of 50% population. And many people know that America resigned from the Nehru's ministry in 1951 on the three, four grounds. Number one, he did not accept the foreign policy of Jawaharlal Nehru. Number one. Number two, he was strongly asking for the appointment of the backward classes commission under 340 of the constitution of India, which was not appointed by the Nehru. Number three, and he was keen to pass the Hindu Code Bill, which was a charter of the women's rights, specially belongs to Hindu community in the parliament. Parliament, we know very well the story of the Hindu Code Bill. The lot of the parliamentarians suppose Times of India published a cartoon in those days. A small girl holding a hand of Ambedkar walking inside the parliament, and another man standing with a sword attacking Ambedkar. The cartoon was published in Times of India. Ambedkar was keen to liberate the Indian women, at least in a matters of family life, divorce, partition, succession, inheritance, which our caste pyramidical Hindu culture or society denied for years together. An attempt of reconstruction. Nehru refused to pass because he was about to face the first general election. And since the Congress party or Nehru as a Prime Minister, he was to face a first general election, the Congress people warned Jawaharlal Nehru that he should not take up the issue of the Hindu court bill. 
otherwise we will lose the election. And in a football constituency, he openly said that I cannot take the agenda of the Hindu government. Ambedkar is high. Now Ambedkar basic reason was here. He was quite vocal in saying that in 1950 we have built up this country on the pillars of the modern values like a liberty, equality, fraternity and justice without gender injustice. In that case, how we can continue with the life of gender injustice? The discrimination between men and women. And therefore he said, if India is to be built up in a real sense on the pillar of equality, we must end the disparity between the men and women. The women should be made the equal partners of the Indian civil life. And so he gave the reason. Therefore, I am resigning from the Nehru's government. And so he resigned. Subsequently, the government realized the wiseness of America. I will pass all this Ambedkar's suggestions of the Hindu court will in a peaceful form in 1955 and 1956. Even today we have to continue that journey. And where is that journey? When the Sheen Shabarimala temple, you are not allowed. Darga, Bombay, recently due to Supreme Court, you enter into. So America raised the issue in 1950 when India is facing even today. Because the policy formulators, the policy makers of this country, they hardly see anything wisely in the ideology of the struggle of America. That's the reason. That's the main reason. One more charge which is leveled against America and that is America was never a part of a freedom struggle. Because in this country many people, there are lot of people who take the credit for the freedom struggle. Even in a Goa freedom struggle, you, we know very well how many people take a credit for the Goa freedom or Goa liberation struggle. Similarly, in the Indian freedom struggle, lot of people take the credit for the India's independence. And the India's independence, the whole has been monopolized in the name of Gandhiji. Forgetting the role of the Bhagat Singh and the Subhash Chandra and many others. I am not deliberating on that issue, but just I am hinting that point. That entire freedom struggle has been monopolized in the name of the Gandhi. But Ambedkar in 1942, when that Chodo Bharat movement was launched, he told the congressman, that what is your fight? Your fight is against the Britishers. If I join you, probably I will be bigger fighter than you against the Congress, against the Britishers. But the fight which I have started, whether you people are ready to fight or join it, are you ready to join my struggle? And he has referred in a book what Congress and Gandhi have done to the untouchables in 1946, the published book. He has quoted the several statements of the presidents of the Congress party and one of the statements of the president, Surendranath Banerjee. And Banerjee says, although we are socially backward, we don't have a social reform agenda, that does not mean we are not eligible for the freedom. And America says, if the Congress president takes this kind of a position, then how I can join your freedom struggle? So he further says that, if I join your freedom struggle, I may be in a better position to fight against the Britishers than you. But you should understand, your freedom struggle is against the slavery of the 150 years old. My freedom struggle is against the slavery of the 5,000 years. Probably, my freedom struggle is bigger than your freedom struggle. Now in a today's context, we can again verify the claim and the statement of America. Whether America was right and his statement is correct even in the today's context, when we see the one-fourth of the Indian population coming to the several crores and equivalent to the several crores or the millions population of some of the European countries which still face the process of discrimination, and the segregation. Ambedkar still comes to. And therefore, Ambedkar was fighting for a freedom which is in a different connotation rather than limited 
an annotation of the freedom struggle from the foreign yoke, and that is the Britishers. That needs to be understood. Once we understand in that context, probably people will have better understanding of Ambedkar than the others. Apart from this aspect, as I referred Ambedkar's writing on agriculture, small land holdings in 1980, problems of Indian agriculture. Now we talk of problems of Indian agriculture in the context of Swaminathan Commission's report, 2006. And Swaminathan Commission analyzes the causes of the farmer sufferings in India, the issues related to the Indian agriculture and what needs to be done. And what needs to be done includes even what is the market facility which will fetch the better income to the farmers. 2006 report came and the today's 2016 future senior is what? More than 3 lakh farmers have committed a suicide in this country. In Maharashtra, last 6 months, more than 2,100 farmers have committed a suicide, including 1,300 in the Vidarbha region and near about 800 in a Maratpara region. What it speaks? Go back to Ambedkar in 1918. And 1918, he categorically said that Indian agriculture needs to be modified needs to be made modern agriculture, number one. Number two, he said Indian agriculture should be considered as a state industry. Now this is very vital. Even today, we have not considered Indian agriculture as a state industry. Number three, he said the abolition of landlordism is an essential. We know very well in 1951, by the first Constitutional Amendment Act, we abolished the landlordism. Ambedkar speaks about abolition of landlordism in 1915, which he again followed in 1936 by introducing the bill in the Bombay Legislative Assembly. So he is the first legislator in this country to introduce the bill for the abolition of landlordism, zamindari system, the feudal culture. So he is the first legislature. And the last issue which he raised about the Indian agriculture is productivity. Now, what is the productivity of the Indian agriculture today? And the very less productivity. So, so the farmer suffers. He said how to improve? And he said there are two methods. One is the capital intensive method, second is the labor intensive method. Taking into account the vast population of this country, we should go for the labor intensive method rather than capital intensive method, that is the one. And next is very important, he speaks in 1918, tremendous pressure of the population on Indian agriculture. He speaks in which year? 1918. Probably among the Indian scholars and the economists, only Justice Ranade who is near to Ambedkar as far as the pressure of the Indian population on agriculture. So he said, there is an absolute need to reduce the pressure of a population on Indian agriculture. Now, as I said, he said, abolition of landlordism. So he introduced the 1936 Bombay Legislative Assembly Bill for the abolition of landlordism. He said, the pressure of the population should be reduced. So, in 1938, he is the first legislator in the country to introduce the bill for population birth control. Population birth control. So, he introduced the bill in 1938. Now, 1938 we know very well. Even in 2016 we know very well. Children are the gifts of the God. We are not responsible for it. That's our part of a culture. That is our part. What a social norm? We call it as a standard norm in a sociology. Our standard norm is the children are the gifts of their. We are not responsible. Ambedkar speaks in the birth control in 1936. Now, birth control, if you read his speech which he has given in the Bombay Legislative Assembly, at that time he has compared the fertility growth of the Indian women with the Chinese women. 
He has compared the fatality growth of the Indian women with the other women, saying that why the population explosion in this country is so high and how it could be reduced. He speaks in 1938, but in a population control method, we hardly consider Ambedkar as an, uh, as, as, as an expert or a connected authority. We hardly say about it. Apart from population explosion, America deal with the several issues. For example, in 1942 to 1946, four years, he was the minister in the Viceroy Executive Council, holding the charge for four important departments, labor, water, irrigation, and electricity. Here, Nehru government could not marginalize Ambedkar here. Because Ambedkar was so keen to have the planning process of the Nehru's ministry, so as to build up the modern India. We always come across, who are the builders of the modern India? And we read the names, Nehru and others. We hardly see the name of Ambedkar. Hardly Ambedkar name is figured here. But let me give you these two, two, three instances how Ambedkar is the builder of modern India, how he has reconstructed. And 1942 to 1946 began in charge of these four things, vital, labor, electricity, water and irrigation. Ambedkar handles this department in a such a way that his work in these four departments have become a pioneering for the further developments in this area. <coughs> for example, water policy. Nowadays we talk about the water, water problem, how to divert, and we have the so-called scholars dig a well here and there. Ambedkar says, excess water cannot be a liability, it is an asset. In this country, we have considered excess water as a liability and we allow it to flow to either sea and we, make, we don't make hardly an effort, an effort to store it or divert it to a desert. Now being involved with the policy formulation, he comes with the plan of a river connectivity from just excessive areas or excessive water areas to deserted areas, no water areas. In that process, he tried to connect at least three prominent rivers from the northeastern India to the rest of the part of the country. And therefore, water policy as such, for the first time, came into existence under the political leadership of Medgar. What type of political class we have, that's a different story. But a water policy of the modern India, as such it came into existence under the political leadership of Dr. Ambedkar. And it was well acknowledged by person not less than by Dr. Homi Bhava. 42 to 45 Ambedkar gave a political leadership. And in 46 the water commission was headed by uh, Mr. Homi Bhava, Dr. Homi Bhava. And when that the project of Damodar Valley was some kind of inauguration function, the water policy function, Nehru was presiding that function. And Nehru said that such projects are the temples of modern India. That's the famous statement. Nehru's two statements, universities are the modern temples of learning and the dams are the modern temple, temples of the modern India. That is the two famous statements. And Baba reminded Nehru that Ambedkar is a real architect of these modern temples. Because Ambedkar vacated that post, post in 1945, 1945-46, he vacated that post of the Viceroy Executive Council. So Baba headed it. And when Nehru said in the one of the function in 46 that these modern temples, temples of the modern India, Baba was right. At that spot only he reminded Nehru that it is because of Ambedkar we have traveled from this distance to this. 
बिलो बरेबल द दामोदर वैली कॉरपोरेशन द फर्स्ट हाइड्रो इलेक्ट्रिकल पावर प्रोजेक्ट ऑफ दिस कंट्री फर्स्ट हाइड्रो पावर प्रोजेक्ट बेस्ड ऑन द टेनिस वैली कॉरपोरेशन अंबेडकर वाज नॉट अ सिविल इंजीनियर और दैट काइंड ऑफ इंजीनियर ही वाज अ सोशल इंजीनियर बट यू नो वेरीबल अंबेडकर वाज कीन टू स्टडी द ऑल बेसिक प्लान्स एंड द डॉक्यूमेंट्स ऑफ द टेनिस वैली कॉरपोरेशन बिल्ड अप इन द यूनाइटेड स्टेट्स ऑफ अमेरिका he brought all the documents got it studied himself prepared the plan asked the one prominent executive uh, engineer from the punjab at that time mr khosla asking him in khosla to execute the project and khosla said ambedkar i cannot execute ambedkar asked why and he gave two clear cut statements number one you are a strong critic of gandhi so i cannot work work under you number two you are by birth untouchable so i cannot work under you These are the two states. Forty-six. America asked Mr. Kosla, "Fine, no problem." But I am giving you an opportunity, Mr. Kosla, that there are engineers in the United States of America. They have built up the Tennis Valley Corporation. I would like to show the entire world that even India has such kind of <coughs> talented engineers who can bring the project like the Tennis Valley Corporation in the form of Damodar Valley Corporation. Are you ready? and then he says yes i am ready so people take a time to understand ambedkar even khosla had its own time and even today there are lot of khoslas in india who are yet to understand ambedkar in that context because ambedkar has attacked each and every traditional center of the power and when you attack the traditional centers of the power you are disliked by many you are unacceptable to many and that exactly happened with ambedkar and therefore ambedkar writes in his one of the writings saying that i hate gandhi i hate jina not because i dislike them but one day my countrymen will realize that the country is bigger than gandhi and jina now the small statement just hardly one sentence and that one sentence makes it very clear that a country needs to be placed at a higher parametrical level than the an individual then only you can reconstruct the country you can start the society and the people of this country being an individualistic in nature the followers of the personality as such or the impressed by that cult movement they like to have a particular personality as their hero in that case ambedkar doesn't figure there when he writes on the thoughts on pakistan that's the thing ambedkar is known for is a 22 big big prioritizes on different issues from caste to reconstructive role of dhamma buddha and his dhamma he travels from what congress and gandhi have done to the untouchables who are the untouchables why they became so he comes through the thoughts on pakistan different issues and in thoughts on pakistan he analyzes the territorial geographical and psychological reasons of the creation of the pakistan in that case he also again suggest that in that case how in future there will be a less damage to the both independent countries that care has to be taken if you don't take the care the problem will be worse in the future exactly what happened 67 years every day even today border level two three people are killed from this year or that side the problem still continues and they, when this problem continues even in the international sphere ambedkar was the vocal critic of an aerobian policy an aerobian policy which formed the backbone of the non alignment movement independent ness from the other blocks of the international level ambedkar in 1954 speaking in the council of the states attack on aero's foreign policy saying that in 1950 we became the independent in 1954 we have to ask a question in the span of the four years how many friends we have at the international level whether there is any single country to support any resolution moved by the our government at the international conference <coughs> pertinent question pertinent question as a result of a china's policy as we know very well 
Nehru was a very closely or rather keen to have a friendship with the Nehru. Even he, he tried to follow that uh, uh, formula of the Panchashil in the international agreements. Ambedkar said, you cannot trust China. You should not. And even if China preaches the doctrine of the Panchashil, you should never believe. Ambedkar was quite categorical in saying that, especially when Panchashil comes from the communist country, you should never believe. And exactly what happened in 62? Even today, when our all borders have been surrounded by the Chinese territories or the China occupant territories, Ambedkar was quite critical when Tibet was taken over by the China. <coughs> Ambedkar was opposing the Nehruan policy, saying that, look here, around the border of the Nepal, China is very near. By occupying the entire Tibet, China will be creating the problem in the future. Now we are witnessing the problem of the Arunachal Pradesh. You cannot have even the work under the National Employment Guarantee Scheme under the Arunachal Pradesh. You start construction of the bridge, China takes an object. So allowing our neighbor countries to come to such a level, at international level, the governments have committed a several serious blunders. America was quite vocal about it. But again, his views hardly reflected in those policies. Ambedkar was a keen support of industrialization. He himself was in favor of rapid industrialization. But rapid industrialization does not mean industrialization coming through the private players. This is again you have to distinguish. Ambedkar was in favor of rapid industrialization through state plan economy through state plan economy, through state interventions. So he was the firm believer that all the basic and key industries should be within the control of the union, that is the government. He further said in his one of the documents, States and Minorities, which he submitted in 1942 to the cabinet mission, he said, Allowing the private players to occupy the role of the government, that will be a dangerous to country. Current situation analyze. Allowing the private players to take over the basic or key industries or the process of development, instead of the state initiatives, that will be dangerous to India. Now, America's statement 42. Let us analyze in 2016 how prophetic his prophecy or the statement is. We can verify now. When the entire state apparatus works for the private player, when the state apparatus work for the private player, and I can give an example, special economic zones, America stood for the consolidation of the lands in order to increase the agricultural productivity. Now we have the consolidation of land in order to form them into the special economic zones and give it to private player, the industrials, the corporate house, or the corporatization of agriculture. America was quite vocal that even the issue of the land should be taken in a such a way that in our country, we have the millions of the people whose hands are waiting for the work. And on the other hand, there is a thousands of the hectares of the land vacant in this country which is waiting for the cultivating hands. So let us meet together, create a, such a formula where this, the land which is waiting for the, waiting for the cultivation and the hands which are waiting for the labor. Let us have a meeting between two. That's Ambedkar formula. Hardly considered. Hardly considered. And therefore, process of industrialization he agreed. But state initiative, rapid industrialization. Further, he says, we should learn a lesson from the Western world. Western world focus on industrialization. But Western world has created a huge inequality between the classes. We know even in the United States of America, three, four years back, we had a movement called as 
one dollar versus ninety nine dollars. Now let us go back. If India follows the Western model of rapid industrialization, India will have the problem of inequality, economic inequality, along with the social inequality, which is a problem for the years. Let us verify a better statement. There is a Global Wealth Report 2016. Global Wealth Report. And this Global Wealth Report of 2016 says in India, 1% top population has a control over 58.6% wealth of this country. 58.6%. Now if 1% population holds the wealth of this country to such an alarming extent, America says India should learn a lesson from the Western countries. As we learn. Because Towers of the power or corridors of the power still considered America as untouchable in a policy formulation. Reason is, we hardly discover a wisdom in it. Finally, America adopted different strategies of reconstruction. Right from education to conversion and right from agriculture to culture. Very wide range. Very wide range. Agriculture to culture. He adopted different strategies, different strategies from time to time. So some people find there is an inconsistency between America's thought. But America was not sitting in an isolated library and concentrated on developing a theory of liberation. He was leading from the front a basic rights struggle, which was one of the biggest human rights struggle in this world. So he was not engaged in a formulation of theory. And America was also Knowing this way, he answered, consistency is a virtue of an ass, and I don't want to follow the consistency. So he was also realizing that. The point is that, in a different strategical dimensions, Ambedkar was approaching different issues from different angles. Finally, in order to reconstruct Indian society, he followed the method of the Buddha tradition. As each and every social revolt in this country has come to an end in a logical manner. Either it is the Mahatma Phule or any social reform in the Northwest or even North India. In logical manner. So in an attempt of reconstructing the society, Ambedkar followed a Buddhism. Again, let me remind, in 1881, in 1881, the William Hunter, William Hunter, a noted scholar, British scholar, he predicted there will be a revival of Buddhism. Ravindra Tagore wrote a poem, Buddha Deva, and in that poem he said there will be a revival of Buddhism. Ambedkar is the person who revived the Buddhism. And Buddhism, justifying, he said, the purpose of the religion is to explain how this world came into existence, how it will be survived, the civil code of do's and don'ts. And Ambedkar says, Dhamma's purpose is not. Dhamma's purpose is to reconstruct the world, not to interpret the world. So in order to reconstruct the Indian society, Ambedkar adopted different strategies from time to time, which few people or rarely people understand in a positive perspective. And therefore, I must thank the organizers of the Go of Festival in order to propagate the ideas and the struggles of Dr. Ambedkar. With these few words, I thanks all of you. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Dr. Mani, for that uh, revelation of how close Ambedkar was to so many issues in the creation of contemporary India. Most of us would not be aware of. Uh, uh, we have very little time, uh, less than 10 minutes. So I would uh, open it to questions, just a few questions. Uh, please be brief. You mentioned that Ambedkar was not known mainly because most of his writings were in Marathi, but, but he had also left a huge volume of writings in English. And many a times, was, um, was it not a, a deliberate discrimination because in our uh, schools, we have never read anything about Ambedkar, but we read a lot of things about Gandhi. 
So was it a deliberate discrimination? Because he has written a lot of things in English. And the second one is that 1936 he wanted an annihilation of this monster called Garst. Today in India, what is the position? Is it bigger or is it smaller? Because today when you see the monster is still there, only thing is that people, only people who get marginalized have been changed. We even understand that in Tamil Nadu, the so-called high caste are now marginalized. Even the Patels and Jats, they feel that they are marginalized. So monster has grown much bigger or is it the same? Thank you. Study. So uh, on behalf of audiences, I must thank you. Uh, I have one small question. In fact, I just wanted to know what was Ambedkar's policy or solution to the indo pak the issue at that time. I'll be highly glad to hear it from you. Thank you, Dr. Manik, for this enlightening talk. Just one question that uh, we had was, uh, do you think the current uh, Indian state, or the current setup of India, uh, is inadequate to uh, accept and implement the policies of Ambedkar? Because entire writing corpus is available in English after 1991 is yet to be translated in a several local languages, regional languages, number one. Number two, if it is translated, it is wrongly translated. For example, I will tell you, the scheduled caste is the English word. It is a translated as a origin. Ambedkar objected this word. Ambedkar says, so, so, so that's what I'm saying. So that origin word, was coined by Gandhi and in a larger context people understand even that. So Ambedkar took an objection, so scheduled caste Anasuchit Jati, that's a translation, but it is translated in Malayalam in Harijan, so that is the wrong translation, number two. Number three, in schools and colleges, as I told you, that for early, almost even 40-45 years, Ambedkar was hardly taught and included in a curriculum. I told, I gave an example, the annihilation of caste. Five years back in Mumbai University syllabus, I don't know what is the position of Goa University here. <coughs> One must check it, then you will understand. There was a visiting professor program in Goa University, which was entirely based on these texts. So, so the reason is, as I told you, basically Ambedkar is an anti-establishment model. People hardly like it. I told you, his struggle is against the status quo system, the status quo values. Now I am preserve of all such values, so I will not go for it. That is the reason. I said again, as Upendra Bakshi rightly said, there is an organized conspiracy to silence Ambedkar thoughts. And that is conspiracy continues. So Ambedkar is hardly known. Coming to your second question, what was the second issue? Monster. No, no. Monster, yes. About the monster of the caste. Now the effects of the, this monster has many minds, but the forms of this monster has changed. Earlier, the forms was only limited in a social pyramid. Now the forms have been also changed in a different connotations. So monster exists, not died, because we have never a national agenda to kill this monster. Annihilation of caste has never become a national issue. Although many people talk against the reservation, but reservation comes because of what? So unless you demolish that big, you cannot kill this small. So, our tendency is to deal with the effect, not with the cause. The cause-effect theory, the basic doctrine of Buddha. So, we hardly deal with the cause. We deal always with the effect. Therefore, there is a famous quotation. If you want a reservation free nation, you give us caste free nation. If you give us caste free nation, we will give you a reservation free nation. So, that is, that is the connotation. And that is the idea basic value. Secondly, about the Indo Park. Indo Park, Ambedkar has written a treatise on partition of India, the basic text, which was referred 
by the leaders of both Congress and the Muslim League during the partition period. But he was suggesting that in order to form a separate nation, there should be a psychological unity of a particular group. So like India, a nationalism. That is also one thing. So he suggested that the entire Muslim population should be brought to India. Uh, Hindu population should be brought to India and a Muslim population which is willing to go there. That should be allowed to go. So he suggested free mobility, not forced mobility again. It's not a distressed migration. He suggested a free mobility. So who's psychologically suit to the two nation theory, like a Pakistan, they should be allowed to migrate. There should not be restraint. Had it been done in a positive way, better way, still the situation could have been a, 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 in, a, in a better way. But that has not been done in that period. Because that time the government was a least function. Even for that, America wrote a letter to the Nehru that allowed all, all untouchables from Pakistan to travel to India. Make governmental efforts. But he again said that governmental machinery is not doing enough efforts even to bring untouchables, the scheduled caste, which we call it now, the untouchables from Pakistan to India. So he gave a call to his followers saying that, leave the Pakistan, come to India. India will be a proper home, not to the Pakistan. But he could not manage because he was not handling the charge of the migrating people from here to there. So there should have been a better management about the migration of the population. The evil could have been brought down. Number third, coming to the last question here. Yeah. Number third, as you said, uh, Ambedkar is a neglected the governmental policy formulation, yes. I, dis I, I agree with the complete uh, whatever he expressed his views because government stands for the not a transformed society. Government stands for the status quo in society, the existing society. The government is not committed for the reconstruction. In fact, Ambedkar through the constitutional law demanded the state interventionist role to reconstruct the society. State should do this. State shall not do this. These, these are the commands in the constitution. So most of the policy formulators, they are either not aware or they are not eager, keen to absorb the Ambedkar's policy in the policy formulation because it doesn't suit the government. Yeah.